So, I'm Sarah Moyer, medical director at the health department and also um, assistant professor in family and geriatrics medicine here at UofL. And I am going to be talking about Zika, as you said. So, <clears throat> going to go over the history of Zika, a little bit of the epidemiology, and then review the most up-to-date guidelines. Um, one caveat, these are changing daily. I gave this talk about a month ago, and I had to update probably half the slides because things keep changing, which is great. Um, and then go over our um, local mosquito program and what a little bit of what we will do if we can come here. So I got nothing to disclose. Most all the information that's in here um, is from the CDC. So if you want to look at more details later, it's all on their website. And if you're referencing this in the future, please look at CDC's website because the guidelines keep changing. So Zika, um, it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It's part of the genus Flavivirus family um, of Flavivirdae. <laughs> Uh, it's closely related to other mosquito-borne illnesses like dengue, yellow fever, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile virus, and it was first found in 1947 uh, and named after the Zika forest in Uganda. First human cases were in 1952, and then it kind of dropped off the radar a little bit. We've had a few out there were a few out outbreaks in Africa, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, um, but nobody really thought much of it. Um, until 2005. 2005, like what I call the year of Zika, um, Brazil first notified the WHO um, in March of a mysterious rash illness that was affecting a large portion of the population. Um, in May, they were able to confirm that Zika virus was circulating uh, among the Americas. And then July of 2015, the first reports of neurologic disorders were associated um, with infection. They were reporting some Gillian Barr and some other neurological inpatients that had had this mis well, mysterious rash like illness that they discovered with Zika. Um, in October, Brazil um, first started reporting the increase in microcephaly cases. They had about a 20 fold increase in cases in 2015. Um, and between November and January, the number of microcephaly cases continued to increase. Microcephaly is small brains in newborn babies. And then in February 1st, 2016, the WHO declared that the recent association of Zika with the microcephaly and other disorders constituted a public health emergency of international concern. Um, and we all started thinking about Zika. What, so before I go any farther, I have a lot of medical terms in here. What's everyone's background? Is everyone here public health? Anyone, medical student or physician? Nursing student? Besides the front row, all public, public health. Okay. All right, so raise your hand if you don't know a term or it's confusing. Please, please interrupt. It's hard to forget what medical terms you didn't know where you had to learn a whole new language when you go through medical school. So Zika is transmitted um, mostly through the bites of mosquitoes, specifically the Aedes mosquito. And this is what we call aggressive daytime biter. Connie is back there in the back row. If anybody has a mosquito questions, she is your lady. Uh, but they can also bite at night. But um, sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, but mostly a daytime biter in this is the opposite of West Nile mosquitoes, which tend to be more shade, evening biters, and malaria as well, which you think of as that dawn and dusk. The 80s um, mosquito is more the daytime sunny mosquito. It could also be transmitted um, congenitally and perinatal, which, um, which means at the time of birth, from a mom that has a high, what we call viral load, she's got a high level of infection, she can give it to her baby as well. There's also been reports of it being transmitted sexually, um, through blood, and then also lab exposure. And theoretically, we haven't had any reported cases yet, um, it could be transmitted like organ or tissue transplant as well. Um, it has been found in breast milk, but there's been no reports of transmission, and um, they're still recommending breastfeeding. 
So where are these Aedes mosquitoes here in the U.S.? So the Aedes aegypti, which we know Zika is, and right now that's what's going on in all of Latin and South America, can be found mostly the southern U.S., southeastern U.S. Aedes albopictus, which is the, a cousin of it, um, is all the way up here in Kentucky, yeah, most of the eastern U.S. We did have the Aedes aegypti in Kentucky in 2012, um, and, but not this year that I know of. Uh, but we do have the Aedes albopictus all over our state. So right now, um, the latest data from the CDC, um, this is all the countries that there's active transmission of Zika going on. So all of South America, pretty much except for Chile and Uganda, or Uruguay, sorry, thank you. Um, Southeast Asia, um, all of the Caribbean, Latin America, and now even the U.S. Heard in the news. But back in January, um, experts got together and tried to predict um, what the threat of Zika would be in the U.S. this year. And they uh, mapped it out according to where that Aedes aegypti mosquito has been found, and then also the cities that have the biggest um, import <laughs> of well, immigrants, people who traveled to countries that had active Zika transmission back in January when they were doing this map. So Miami, um, highest risk, the red color means um, the bigger the circle is, the more people they have traveling monthly um, from those countries, and the, um, the darker the color is, the higher the risk, so like the combination of the mosquito and the um, number of travelers. So Miami was predicted to be the biggest threat of getting Zika in 2016, and that has panned out to be true. So as you've probably seen in the news, Zika is now... Um, in the Miami area, specifically Miami Beach, that red area, um, but there is probable transmission going on in that whole yellow area. So the red area is definitely where we know it's actively being transmitted right now. That little squared off one block radius, windward, uh, Miami. Um, they had active transmission over the summer, like July, and that has stopped. They were able to clear. So the red areas right now are where it's going on. So as of October 19th, we've had 4,016 cases, um, confirmed cases of Zika here in the United States. Um, 137 were locally acquired, so those are the cases coming out of Miami. And majority of our cases are travel associated, the 3,878. We have, we've had one lab case, 32 sexually transmitted cases, and 13 Gillian Barr syndrome. The Gillian Barr is a neurologic disorder um, that basically kind of paralyzes you, um, and you usually have to be on a vent until your muscles recover and you can breathe again. Um, very serious complication, but um, we haven't had any deaths yet from it. The U.S. territories, the territories that includes Puerto Rico, um, the U.S. Virgin Islands, have had 27,000 cases, and majority of them, the number's wrong, it's a little bit less, <laughs> um, are locally acquired. Only 88 were travel associated, um, and they've had 48 cases of Gillian Barr. Does that say a question? Uh, pregnant women. We are tracking pregnant women a lot more closely, and um, the U.S. and D.C. have had 899 cases as of October 13th, and the U.S. territory is 1,927 confirmed cases. Here in Jefferson County, we've had, we've tested 85 people so far, and um, 10 have been positive. All are travel-related. Four with Nicaragua, um, El Salvador, Venezuela, U.S. Virgin Islands, Mexico, Haiti, and Puerto Rico. Um, so look back at the, that map, it's all um, Latin, South America, traveling, and only one pregnancy. So what, what does Zika look like? Um, the main symptoms are a fever, um, the red eyes, pale skin with a rash. 
Um, some people get the muscle, small joint aches, um, and headache and diarrhea are less common. So not, nothing super specific. Um, and what complicates it more is most infections are asymptomatic, meaning that the patients don't even know that they've been infected with the Zika virus. Um, they don't know that they're sick. And those that are do get sick, it's very mild. Um, hospitalization is really uncommon with Zika. Um, it's kind of like the flu or cold. Um, you get better in several days to a week. Um, and fatalities are rare, too. So this is why we first discovered Zika in, what, 47, that I mentioned before, and it dropped off the radar until we started seeing that um, association with microcephaly. The incubation period um, is 3 to 14 days, so if you've traveled or gone to Miami and got bitten by a mosquito, um, that, that two-week window is when you don't have, could not have symptoms and then develop it. So if you travel to, uh, we'll say, Mexico, two months ago and today you come down with a rash and red eyes, it's probably not Zika. So other things that are associated with Zika are microcephaly and congenital anomalies. gillian Barr, as I mentioned, and then other neurological syndromes like brain ischemia, transverse myelitis, and meningeal encephalitis, big medical words that I cannot say, and thrombocytopenia, which is a little platelet. Um, but the differential um, is huge. Dengue and chikungunya are probably the two um, other most common ones because these are actively circulating in those Latin American countries as well right now. Um, but these patients tend to be sicker. Um, if you look at the clinical features trying to compare Zika um, to dengue and chikungunya, um, the fever is a lot worse than dengue and chikungunya. The rash is probably a little bit worse than Zika. Um, but dengue is the big one that we have to rule out um, because the, the big reason is um, it's contraindicated to give NSAIDs, which is your Advil, Aleve category of medicine to anybody who has dengue because it can worsen the, the hemorrhage symptoms that they have. And so Mary can tell you that everyone that we test for Zika also gets tested for these other viruses as well, so we can confirm that it's not one of them. Question. No question? Not yet. I have a question about the lab, but you're getting there. I'm oh, getting I'm, there. I'm I want to know there. about false positives. Okay. So the general labs, um, if someone comes to their to your office, well not your office, they come to my office, they're very not specific. C B C is pretty much as normal, um, maybe some mild lymphopenia, neutropenia, um, and maybe some thrombocytopenia, which is just low, low different levels of those. Inflammatory markers um, are mildly elevated, just means that they're sick. So nothing nothing that tells you that they actually have Zika or something else. Um, so testing, um, we recommend you work with the health department. I guess LabCorp and Quest now are also doing it, but um, call us and we will walk you through if you think um, you, ha you have a patient that has Zika or you got a friend that traveled there and you want them to get tested, you know, someone who's trying to get pregnant, work with us. Because um, right now the CDC is just recommending testing for people who've traveled to an area of Zika and have symptoms consistent with, with it. So you come back from your mission trip and you've got conjunctivitis and a rash, a fever, let us know, let your doctor know, and we will test you for Zika. If you travel and come back, don't have any symptoms, but you see you got a mosquito bite. Um, unless you are pregnant, right now we are not testing, and that is because of the the tests are all new. So we didn't start developing tests for Zika until this last year, and so there's kinks are being still worked out. And so we CDC only recommends it if you have a high pretest probability that it's going to be correct. So that's people with symptoms and history of travel, or they've had unprotected sex with someone who's confirmed to have Zika, because Zika can be sexually transmitted. Um, right now, we're testing the urine and the blood. None of you guys are physicians, but that are seeing patients. But we would just two tubes of blood and one container of urine. Um, the big thing is all pregnant women should be assessed for possible Zika exposure at every visit. We have we're very 
international city. We've got people who travel all the time. We have a lot of immigrants, refugees, um, people you might not think of traveling back home. Um, big thing, if all OBGYNs, people seeing prenatal visits, um, need to be asking at every visit if they patients have a history of travel. Right now it's recommended that everyone who's traveled get tested for Zika because that 80% don't have any symptoms and there's a strong link with pregnancy and that Microsoft link. Um, so if that was confusing, the CDC has a really nice little graph. Um, when to test for Zika. Uh, if there, are you experiencing symptoms? which is that red eye, fever, joint pain, rash, and have you traveled um, to an area with Zika? If it's yes, you test for Zika. If it's no, have they had unprotected sex with a partner who has traveled to an area with Zika? No, don't test. Yes, test. Right now, the CDC is not recommending testing for Zika for people who have no symptoms, <clears throat> no matter their travel history, for women, children, and, or men, children, and women who are not pregnant. So the only person that can get tested right now that's recommended to get tested is women who, I forget what I was saying. Only, the only asymptomatic people that we are testing for Zika is women that are pregnant. What about their partners? Because of the... Yeah, so right now we are not testing the partners unless the, if they had symptoms then we will test them. If they don't have symptoms, we're recommending no sex for six months. <laughs> yes, I will get to that too. So yeah. what tests we do in the first two weeks, there's a PCR test on the serum, serum and urine. Um, if it's been over that two weeks, we do IgM first right now um, and neutralizing the antibodies. There's some other tests that are in the works. But since you guys are not testing, just call the health department if you want somebody tested, and we'll walk you through with most. What's rec currently recommended? Does that answer your question, Dr. Summer? No. <laughs> What's question? Uh, what is a false positive rate for a a given probability of disease? I don't know the false positive rate off the top of my head. Um, and I think it's still like changing because we haven't really tested enough people yet. We're only testing people that are symptomatic right now. I don't really have those numbers. You have multiple tests listed here. So if one is positive, you know, do you go in a sequence and order more tests before it's called confirmed positive or yes. not? Um, so if we can test in the first two weeks after the start of illness, I think the PCR is the only test we do and we consider that being done. If they're, we're testing it later for some reason, if the IgM is positive, then we send it out for the neutralizing antibodies and we don't consider it positive until the neutralizing antibodies come back. Right. positive. Um, the serology for IgM can be positive if um, they've had other associated viruses, dengue, right. chikungunya, okay. etc. And, and how long does it take for the neutralizing antibody test to come back? A long time. Um, we've got one pregnant patient that we've been what, waiting, I want to say four months for yeah. everything to come back. Yeah. The PCR test we can get back in about a week. Yeah, the PCR test right now through the state has been about a week. IgM is about the same amount, but the neutralizing antibody test, they have to send that out to the CDC. Okay. So that's what's causing the backlog for that. Okay. Okay. Paying for that. The CDC is paying for that. So if you, do, if you get tested through the health department, um, CDC health department, state health department is paying for it. If you don't want to follow CDC recommendations and want to just get the test on your own, I don't know if insurance will pay for it through LabCorp and Quest. Don't know the answer to that. Um, so pregnant women testing is, is more complicated. Um, so just, yeah, the big thing is just work with us. Basically, you do the IgM 
it, it's kind of like the same. If it's less than two weeks, do the PCR. If it's more than two weeks, um, you do the ICM first and then check the antibodies. Um, if this Zika is a nationally um, notifiable condition, you have to report all cases to the health department. We are tracking them, and that's how we get the numbers that go into those confirmed cases that I told you about at the beginning of but the, uh, the The responsibility for local docs is based on the test or the symptoms? The test. Okay. The confirmed case, yeah. If they have symptoms, then we want them to let us know so we can right. test them. Right. Um, and then... So right now, we're, we're, we're thinking most of the Zika cases have gone through us to get tested, and so we know about it, we're reporting it at the health department. But just in case these commercial tests take off, it is reportable. I have a question. Yeah. All right, so I don't have a medical background, but if a woman is in her second or third trimester, can't you have an ultrasound that pretty much shows whether or not the baby head is growing at the rate that it's supposed to be growing. Yes. And wouldn't that like null out the test that you've been waiting on for four months? Or no. So uh, I'll get into that in a little bit, but um, not all Zika infections mean microcephaly. Okay. Um, right now we've had, I'll show you exact numbers, but I think we've, what, 899 positive Zika cases in pregnant women. There's only 23 cases of microcephaly. So it's just still a small percentage that are actually have the small brain, and there's some other conditions, um, hearing, vision, other brain development that we're worried about, and so we're tracking it, and we want to know anyways if they have Zika, even if they have a normal-sized brain. So treatment for the regular population um, is just resting and drinking lots of fluids, Tylenol. I mean, like I mentioned before, it's really, it's a fairly mild illness. It's not terrible. Most people don't even know they have it. Um, the big thing is just no um, NSAIDs until dengue can be rolled out. Otherwise, rest, you'll survive the week. Um, right now, there's no vaccine or specific medicine. The important thing, though, is just prevent mosquito bites during the first three weeks of illness. It was just one week until last week. Now they're recommending three weeks. You really got to be careful. Um, this can be found in the blood because that's how we might be able to get a case here in Louisville and start the local transmission. If somebody comes back from Miami and then the mosquitoes get it and they can transfer it to somebody else, then we're going to be in trouble. So as much as you can, no mosquito bites in those three weeks if you get diagnosed with Zika. Um, and then abstinence or condoms for six months for men, eight weeks for women. Take my next one. But I'll go into that in more detail. So pregnancy is the big concern with Zika. Um, these are the people really at risk. So it's kind of like rubella um, in the 60s. Before we had a vaccine, um, there was a lot of babies born with hearing and vision, defects, microcephaly, and that's what we're trying to prevent right now with all the efforts we're doing with Zika. So Brazil in 2015 saw this 20-fold spike in microcephaly um, in their country. And there's some research that shows that a third of all deliveries of mother with Zika will have severe birth complications. <coughs> um, but our data right now, um, we had 899 cases so far in the U.S. and only 23 have had um, birth, severe birth defects, that microcephaly, um, and five pregnancy losses noted. So I'm not sure about that one-third. That's what Brazil was re reporting. So microcephaly is a big one. That's a smaller head. Um, fetal, cerebral calcifications, um, it's just like white spots you can see in the brain on those ultrasound, the calcifications, and then other central nervous system um, alterations. There's been reports of like eye defects, hearing loss, impaired growth, and then fetal loss as well. So Zika really disrupts the brain development um, is basically what happens, and so it's very... Um, it's an issue for new babies that are forming, um, and they're still doing research on what that effect is in kids as well. So I can get a sense of, of odds ratios, relative mm -hmm. risk. Do you know, uh, either here or in Brazil, you know, what the average rate of microcephaly you know, is? Um, so here it's 23 out of 899. 
Right, but this this is Zika exposed, right? No, this is Zika confirmed cases. Right, and I'm asking uh, about the Zika uh, births to moms with no Zika. Oh, what the okay? Yeah. Um, I don't know that number off the top okay. of my head, but it's a lot. Well, um, so they had a twenty-fold spike in Brazil, um, where it's Zika is kind of an endemic. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Say about 20 times. How's the risk of microcephaly and Zika infected compared to um, cytomegalovirus? Yeah, so there's been um, a lot of people are like, why don't people care as much about CMV as we do about Zika right now? Because we're, we're still seeing microcephaly cases because of CMV. Um, I'm not sure exact numbers, but um, it's still it's still a big risk a, a risk. And it's probably on a population health. There's probably more babies right now in the U.S. being born with CMV-related issues than Zika. Other questions? Does the infection necessarily clear? I mean, do we know for a fact that it eventually goes away, or does it just live in the body the way EBV or CMV would live in the body? Um, They've shown it to clear from bodily fluids. And blood is about two weeks. Um, and then the longest they've detected it is semen. And right now they've had a case up to six months, which is why it's the recommendation for um, no sex for six months for men. And for women, they're saying eight weeks because they've shown it to be in the vaginal secretions for eight weeks. And that's the longest bodily fluid they've seen. Whether it goes into hiding someplace, I we don't we don't know yet. It's still new. So for your pregnant women that are diagnosed with Zika, like you mentioned, um, guidelines right now are to do ultrasounds every three to four weeks for the rest of the pregnant pregnancy for this woman to monitor for those cerebral calcifications, for the small brains growth, um, etc. Um, and also refer to maternal uh, MFM, maternal fetal medicine specialist, and they have more details of what they look for. Postpartum, or after the baby is born, we test the placenta and the bullet the cord for Zika, um, and also all the other similar viruses, dengue, etc. We also test for all the other, what we call torches, the CMV, um, all the other diseases that can cause small brain. If somebody is, if a baby is born with the, the microcephaly and we didn't know it was Zika, even if we do know it's Zika, we still test for everything else to make a rule out if there's something else complicating it. For the management of the baby, um, it's pretty much normal management. You do a really good physical exam. You're measuring that head circumference um, to check for microcephaly. Um, really good neurologic exam because we know Zika affects the development of the brain. We do do a cranial ultrasound, which is not normal management. That's extra management to look for those calcifications. Um, a really good ophthalmologic exam, more so than just looking at the eyes that we normally do. Um, and then hearing exam, which is normal at birth, but we also they're also recommending at one month and six months just to make sure it's still normal. Um, some blood work, which is not part of routine care of a CDC and a CMP. And then if anything's abnormal, I um, recommend referring to the appropriate um, specialists, whether that's behavior, pediatrics, physical, speech therapy. Um, right now, we don't really have good documentation of what happens as these babies grow up that didn't have the microcephaly that look normal, but we're expecting them, for them to have delays in um, speech therapy, um, they're walking, et cetera, and so it's just really important to refer as early as possible to give them the best chance of recovering and dealing with it. So this is uh, microcephaly. That's a normal um, infant there on the left. Um, microcephaly is that middle one and then severe. So microcephaly is less than 3%, so it's a really small head, um, and that's more detailed than how you actually measure it. But it's... Um, it, it's small. Uh, we've had our, our pregnant patients have not had severe. The one that we have has not had severe microcephaly. It is concerning. So 
So sexual transmission is the new, newer concern. Um, it's, there's about 30 cases so far in the U.S. It's been documented male to female, female to male, um, and it includes everything, vaginal, anal, oral sex, sharing the sex toys. So they're recommending all of that. Um, not having sex can eliminate the risk, and condoms can reduce it. There's nothing, just not having sex is the only thing 100% effective. Men, um, at least six months they're recommending. They've found Zika in the semen up to six months, and women at least eight weeks. Um, and like I mentioned before, it stays in semen longer than other bodily fluids. I don't know why, but that's what research has shown. So for preconception guidance, this is for your patients or friends who've traveled to the Caribbean for a spring break and are coming back and are thinking about having a baby. What do we know right now? We're recommending um, talking to them about it, telling them about Zika, and then to wait, for women to wait um, at least eight weeks after they get back before attempting to conceive, even if they have no symptoms. Yeah, can, can Zika be asymptomatic? Yeah, 80% is asymptomatic. Okay. So it seems like this is not effective. <clears throat> What's not effective? The, the, the preconception guidance. Well, it's, it's basically saying if you go to Miami and you come back, you got to wait eight weeks before you try to have a baby is what we're recommending right now. Oh, no matter if you have symptoms you have no or not. Symptoms. I, I, yep. I missed that one. Okay. Sorry. Yep. If you have symptoms or if you don't. If you're female. Um, if you're male, it's at least six months if you're symptomatic, and it used to be if you're asymptomatic, you only had to wait eight weeks, but last week they changed that. So now they're saying six months if you have symptoms or no symptoms. So they, they keep changing these? They keep changing it, and they keep extending it, which is the really worrisome thing, and so it's really hard to advise patients when they're actually in your office. Um, right now, we think that if you get Zika this year, and next year you have a baby, the baby's going to be fine, we think. But we only have a year and a half worth of research to know that. And so we don't know what happens to these kids long term. And so really the best thing, if, I mean, you just have to weigh the pros and cons. If you want to get pregnant, if you want to travel, what risk are you worth? What, what's the risk worth to you? Um, and time's only going to tell what's going to happen. So let's say a couple of those that you're they come back. And they don't want to have to wait six months to, you know, do anything. So <laughs> can't they just say, well, can't we just get tested? Or what, what would you say? Can't we just get tested right now and then we'll know? Right. Yeah, the problem is the tests are new, and so we don't know that the sensitivity and specificity of the test. So if the test is negative, it's hard to, as a provider, I won't be able to tell you for sure that that negative means it's negative or if that's a false negative. And so right now they're not recommending testing because it's hard to do anything with that test result. And they're not testing semen. They're not testing semen yet, no. Just research-wise they are. Yeah. And still tests are all new, and so it's hard to know if that test is, the semen test is negative. Is it really negative, or is our test bad? So yeah, it's, it's tough. And then if you live in a... Okay, so basically right now, travel guidance, if you're pregnant, no traveling um, is what the CDC is recommending to any of those countries on that map with the orange. Um, if you must travel, you live there, protect yourself from mosquito bites is the big thing. Um, men and women are childbearing age. Um, afterwards, condoms for six months. Um, and then all everybody else, there is no travel restriction. They're just recommending mosquito bite protection. Some people, I've had a lot of questions about Gillian Barr, what's the risk? Um, it's, it's really small. I mean, it's like less than all the other viruses we get here. And so there's no travel restriction right now for non-pregnant people or people that are trying to get pregnant. It's okay. But still recommend mosquito bite protection. So as a reminder, the orange is everywhere. But you can if you want to dive down, like, where where in the country the, the active Zika transmission is. Like, the U.S. is all orange, but it's only Miami right now. You can travel to 
in Colorado, you can come see us in Kentucky and don't have to worry about getting Zika. It's the same in some of those other countries as well, too. Especially like Argentina, that was in the winter up until a few months ago. All right, so those that reside in an area with active Zika transmission, so those of you doing mission trips, um, the recommendations are just to talk to your healthcare provider, kind of weigh the, the benefits and the risks of getting pregnant right now. Um, really kind of weigh in what their reproductive life plan is. Can they wait? Um, age, whatever, do they need to have a baby right now? Um, and then also their risk of exposure. So even though U.S. is on the map, if you live in Colorado, up in the mountains and there's no mosquitoes, you have less risk of actually getting Zika and so less of a concern about getting pregnant right now. But then also, if they do really want to have a baby, how to prevent um, the mosquito bites, how to prevent sexual transmission, and then education just for what happens with Zika and pregnancy. The big thing is to is really talking about um, preventing unintended pregnancies for those that do not want to get pregnant right now because if you're taking that risk I mean having a child with special needs is no easy task so the main goal for public health population health is really to prevent any baby being born that didn't need to be born and so there's been a lot of push for long acting reversible contraception Puerto Rico is doing a lot of work with that that is why the bill for all the Zika funding got tied up in Congress for months and months and months because they wanted to tie it to decreasing funding for contraception, which you can't do when we're trying to prevent pregnancy. Um, with Zika, it's one of the only tools we have um, in preventing the microcephaly cases. <laughs> so that's a big thing. For example, El Salvador came out and said, no women's allowed to get pregnant for the next three years. But by the way, we're Catholic and there's no birth control, so we're trying to prevent that from happening. Yeah. Questions? What, what do you say to a pregnant woman who just found out that she's been infected with Zika? That we're going to monitor your baby closely, doing the serial ultrasounds. Um, and if they find something wrong with the baby, then what? Options counseling. Yeah, depending on what country is. Hmm? Nothing you can do about it. I mean, it depends what you. But in terms of like, um, like treating it without you know terminating the pregnancy. Yeah, no, there's no, there's nothing to do. Yeah, it'd be the same as going through the decision tree when someone finds out their kid has Downs or any of their chromosomal abnormalities. It'd be the same kind of decision making. Whatever is best for that family. Another about the vaccine that's still in the works? Yep, vaccine is still in the works. There's one in phase one trials right now. Um, there, it's really similar to the yellow fever um, virus, and so they're just able to do a little tweak and to, for Zika, and so they're hoping to get it up quickly, a lot more quickly than like HIV, which has been around for what, 30 years now, we still don't have a vaccine. So that is hopeful thing for the future. Not yet. No. So how would you um, convince someone that this is a bigger issue than CMV? Like why are we more concerned about people not getting pregnant because of Zika versus other viruses that cause similar issues? Because it's new and we don't have we don't have antibodies to Zika right now. So Z CMV if um, you've had it before and you get pregnant now like zero risk to the baby, which is what we're supposing to happen to Zika. But right now we have an entire country that's not immune to Zika, and so we have the potential that anybody who gets pregnant can have the microcephaly causes. So in a country that has endemic Zika, mm -hmm. is it likely to be contracted by a traveler who is not immune? Is there any information on that? Say that, you say so that again. Like it's endemic. Yeah, yeah. Locals aren't getting sick. Yeah. But people are traveling there. Are they, is the viral load high in the mosquitoes to give it to many people, or is it not doing anything? I mean, no, the travelers are getting it still. So I think, I'm guessing, I'm thinking like the microcephaly cases of the Brazilians is dying off because 
they're all become immune to it, but we're still having the travel related cases here in the US with people coming back. So how long does it take a country to get immune to? Depends on their mosquito season and how many people get infected. Yeah, we, we don't know yet. Haven't been around long enough. Are, are there cases of microcephaly, you know, maybe in Brazil or, or other places wh where the mother gives birth? We know that it's a secret related microcephaly. She gets pregnant again, you know, is she more likely to have? A, a kid with microcephaly again? No, right now they're showing that there there's no microcephaly in like the second. So right now it's the hypothesis is that it's kind of like the CMV that kids right. stay. Same with like the rubello, we make sure they're not immune. We give the vaccine at birth so okay. to prevent against next pregnancy. Nice. Mom having it. But that is today's hypothesis. We, I don't know if that's going to be true. Yeah. And when those 20, was it 23 cases in the US? Uh, what trimester was the data identified? I don't know the answer to that. There's been um, some studies that show, most studies are showing that um, contracting Zika earlier in pregnancy is worse. If you get in second and third trimester, the effects aren't as bad as if you got it in the first trimester. But we don't know if there's any point after which it's okay. Exactly. No. And they, when the warnings first came out, it was just first trimester, don't travel. Um, but they've extended that to all pregnant women, don't travel. No. Yeah. I know you talked about if you um, have the illness, you're not supposed to prevent getting more mosquito bites. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure about this, but is it because the infection can worsen if you get it? No, it's because we don't want you to transmit the infection to somebody else. So if you have the Zika and the mosquito bites to you, then the mosquito has the Zika, and if they bite somebody else, they can give the Zika to somebody else. So it doesn't matter, no. it doesn't matter the amount of virus in your body? Or... We think it does. Like the higher viral loads, um, more likely that the mosquito will get the virus, but right now it's just blanket. Protect yourself from mosquito bites so we can prevent the transmission to other people. Yeah. So to prevent mosquito bites, use an EPA registered insect repellent. That's the DEET Picard and IR3535 oil, eucalyptus, para, menthol, two wonder a lot of chemicals. Um, if you most um, insect repellents now will tell you if it's like on the bottle that it prevents against West Nile and Zika. It's been a huge advertising for all these the companies. But make sure you look, make sure it has the D or the carbon, or um, if you want something natural, oil of lemon eucalyptus is the, has been proven to work. Um, do not spray under clothing, just spray it on the skin that is showing. And if you are out in the sun, which you are in most of these countries um, that have Zika, apply the sunscreen first and then put the insect repellent on. And not, don't use in kids under two months. The oil, lemon, eucalyptus, you're not supposed to use in kids under three um, as well, but the rest of them you could use up to two months. And that's mostly because it hasn't been studied and nobody wants to study it, but it's probably okay. Um, the big thing is for kids, put it on your own hands and then put it on there. Avoid around their eyes, avoid their hands. They're not eating it and putting it in their eyes. It's a big thing, but everywhere else is fine. Um, wear long sleeves, shirts, and pants protect your skin, so you can spray your, spray your clothes with permethrin, and then um, as much as you can, stay and sleep in places, with air conditioning, window screens, etc., away from mosquitoes, even though this is that daytime biter that we're talking about. Um, the other big thing is remove any standing water around your house, because that's where the Aedes mosquito likes to breed. It can only travel about 150 meters, so um, if you have the mosquitoes, it's because you have a problem in your yard with standing water. Yeah. I'd like to point out the repair job on the leak, you know, uh, out of the back, you know, where they've shunted the water to near the downspout, but it's like this far away, and there is standing water there all the time, you know, uh, from the repair job. Uh, I have communicated with the team. 
around it, about it, but we've made a, a Zika garden, you know. A Zika garden in your own yard, yes. <laughs> Probably true. So um, Louisville's been very fortunate in that we've had an active um, mosquito control program since the 1950s. Um, I did not know this until I moved here, but Louisville used to be a big swamp that they drained, especially the inner, like inside the Waterson. Um, was all used to be swampland, and that's what we're living in. So we have had to keep up our Zika control program um, since the 50s, whereas a lot of other cities, especially across Kentucky, um, across the U.S., have not had an active Zika mosquito control program um, in recent years. So every year um, in the spring, we identify um, persistent areas of standing water, probably not behind this building, but so swamp lands, any, all the catch basins with the sewer system, um, we treat with larvicide um, to control, um, to prevent the baby mosquitoes becoming adult mosquitoes, basically. And that's like really the best way to prevent it. It's much safer, um, easier way than fogging. Um, and then after that, after we treat all those catch basins, um, we put traps um, all across the city in areas we know have a lot of mosquitoes. Um, and in areas where we get a lot of complaints from citizens about high area mosquitoes. So if you have a lot of mosquitoes in your yard, you can just call Metro 311 and we will get the complaint and we will test the mosquitoes. Um, so the trapped mosquitoes are sorted and sent to our lab across the street, which identifies um, if the mosquitoes are carrying Zika or West Nile, um, West Nile St. Louis encephalopathy, um, a bunch of other ones. We test them for disease. And if they are positive, um, and there's areas, if they are positive, we, that is the areas we then decide to go and fog. So this year, last year, um, I think pretty, probably pretty much every year since 1999, we've had a lot of West Nile um, in Louisville. It's pretty much endemic across the entire city. And so when those pools start becoming positive for West Nile, we go out and fog. Um, and we fog with approved pesticides. We fog after dark are at dawn to prevent um, harming the bee population. And if you want to know where all we've fogged, there, there's a link there to take you to our website. Uh, so this is last year's mosquito density. And those are the areas where we found to have high mosquitoes. Um, I live right in the heart of that. So um, this area is where we target those areas to pre -treat, treat with that larvicide and then um, throughout the year when we get high numbers. If we get high numbers or we get disease, that's where we go in fog. So we really need the community's help um, in preventing the mosquitoes from being born. So standing water, uh, it's not just big pockets. The Aedes mosquito likes to breed in just like a bottle cap full of water. They can breed and be transmitted. So. Um, they are really, they're urban living mosquitoes. So take a look around your house, anywhere you have standing water, dump it out, clog gutters, um, kids toys, that's my problem, any tires, um, really is what we can do as a community to help prevent the spread of any mosquito-borne illness. Okay, any questions about mosquitoes before I move on? You have our local expert in the back, Connie, if you guys don't know Connie herself. She runs our mosquito control program. Can you mention how effective the campaign in the Miami area has been? Yeah, I mean, obviously not super effective because <clears throat> when I gave this talk a month ago, there was 30 cases of locally transmitted Zika and now it's up to 159 just in a couple weeks. Um, but they are doing the same thing. They're doing the, the larvicide, they're doing the fogging, they're doing more aerial spraying, more fogging than we are. Um, and they're doing a lot of community involvement trying to get rid of standing water. Yeah. Um, I think I talked about, well, we talked about some of my classes about genetically modifying mosquitoes. Yeah, they're still doing experiments on that. Basically, they're making the, the male mosquitoes sterile so they can't reproduce. And so in one generation, they would die off. Um, but they're having trouble getting it tested because nobody likes genetically modified anything. Um, that's all I know. Do you have more? No more? Yeah. I'm thinking that an not producing or at least it's not a viable offspring. So they've done a small 
Yeah, I saw that too. I don't think it wasn't proven to be true. Yeah, it was a conspiracy theory. I mean, it, it's hard to tease out because right when they had all those mosquitoes, they realized it was a mosquito-borne illness. They probably did all the pesticides and everything to try to kill them off, and then still more babies are born because we didn't get rid of Zika. But um, the initial studies show that that's not true. It's just the Zika. The Yeah, all that, that big list of... Whoops, wrong line. Um, mosquitoes is all, um, it's all been safe, deemed safe, safe by BPA to put on your skin as well. So yeah, so a lot, lots more research is coming. So the NIH um, is tracking all those women that have been pregnant with Zika. Um, they've got about 10,000 pregnant women in Puerto Rico, Brazil, Colombia, that they are tracking through pregnancy, first year of life, so we can have more details to so know, like, yeah, is the risk greater in the first trimester, second trimester? What happens to those babies that are born with normal-sized brains? Um, how do they develop? And they are hoping, now that they got that funding from Congress, they're hoping to have um, ongoing, observe the ongoing health of these kids and see what the effects really are. Um, CDC is monitoring all the outcomes in the U.S. of Zika-infected mothers. Anybody um, that's tested positive for Zika gets put in the Zika pregnancy registry, um, and CDC is closely monitoring all those moms and babies. Um, just checking out developmental milestones, hearing, visual, future, future mental illness are all things that they're expecting to be um, worse in these children. So the NIH and NIAID are, have a vaccine entering phase, phase one clinical trials right now, so hopefully in a year or two we will have an effective vaccine. Um, and they're also working on better tests and quicker tests, so you don't have to wait months to get results back. Um, they're working on a four-hour diagnostic test as well. And then um, the, at the end of September, the Congress finally approved funding um, for Zika, and a lot of that goes back to paying the public health emergency preparedness cooperative back for all the money they've already spent on Zika. Um, CDC, NIH, um, the public health emergency fund, all getting more money, and then um, a big chunk is going to Puerto Rico that has the majority of the cases in the U.S. just to help them with the healthcare services and this basically generation of children that are going to have learning disabilities, visual, hearing disabilities as well. Um, and really just see what happens because we don't know all the answers yet. What if an infant is infected with Zika? Is it, I mean, it has a cause? We don't know yet. So the initial studies show nothing, but we don't know if that affects um, brain development, if they'll have future learning problems because of, because of it. And so they're really just pushing mosquito bite protection um, in all, all kids. Anybody with brain matter that is still growing. So we can't say for sure that it's a zero risk to the infant if the mother's infected. There, because it could be long-term effects. It's like having a zero risk like. Yes, we don't know yet. Yep, we could that one year of data because um, we didn't start looking at Zika as a bigger issue until 2015, 2016. And the past case, the case in the past, like. It was in the middle of Africa that has a lot of other health issues, and so it wasn't big enough that it made national news. There's an outbreak in French Polynesia back in 2013 that they've been able to look back at now and prove that there was microcephaly, but it wasn't high enough that they noticed back in 2013 before we made those Zika leaks in 2015. Um, yeah, so it's hard to go back and look, too. Um, is there any type of um, contact tracing that's being done? Like, for example, like in Miami, you said, so now it's being locally transmitted, so 
it's not the travel requirement, so then how do they start testing more people? How do they find out if there's even more people infected than what they think? They're testing everybody with symptoms in Miami. But symptoms are like flu symptoms, so. Yep. So it could be bigger? It could be bigger than, yeah. Bigger than yep. The, the numbers we have are the confirmed cases, so that's the ones that have been tested and have a lab result. And to prove that they've had it. It definitely could be a lot more than that. But they, they're Especially not like tracing of like partners or things like that? Um, they are like the sexually transmitted cases. Um, that's how they, they're, they're documented how the patients got it as well. So whether if they've traveled, they'll say it's a travel case. If they never left Miami and got Zika, they'll say it's a locally acquired case, et cetera. Is it safe to say that um, there could be mothers who have given birth to babies having had Zika during pregnancy but still not because of it any birth defects in the children? Yeah, majority don't, um, we don't see the birth defects. What, I think it's 23 out of 899. I mean, it, it's still a small number, but it's much greater than before Zika was around. It's a risk, but it's, yeah. Well, I guess, I'm, if there is 80% of the people that don't have symptoms, um, I mean, they would still be tested even if they didn't travel out of the country, or like, are there protocols for that? Because then you really want to know whether or not that person ever had Zika to begin with. Right? Yeah, so, Right now, like in Kentucky, for pregnant women, we're testing everybody who's traveled. So if they have symptoms or not, we're testing them for Zika, or anybody who's traveled to somewhere that they could have gotten Zika. Yeah, okay. If they're pregnant, only if they're pregnant. So we, we're hoping to identify everyone who's pregnant with Zika so we can monitor them more closely. Even that 80% that's asymptomatic. So if they don't have any symptoms, we're still testing them. If they've been somewhere where they could have gotten Zika. What about in Miami? So Miami, they're, they're testing they, everyone. I'm not sure what they're doing with the pregnant population right now, but they're pretty much, they're testing everybody with symptoms. Time for maybe one or two final questions. I'd like to ask, uh, before the Rio Olympics, there was concern that people returning from the teams who visited there, went back to their home countries, might contribute to uh, increased local transmission? Has there been any evidence that that has occurred anywhere? Uh, <clears throat> except for Miami having more trouble, but it's hard to know because they get so many international people in every day. Um, besides that, no. They, they decided it was safe to have the Olympics, that yeah, transmission was low enough that there wasn't a risk. Any final questions? Last question. You know, in the airport, sometimes when you're going to the country, they have like a health card to fill out. Are we doing that here in the U.S.? I mean, separate you. I know last time when I went home, I'm from the Caribbean. Uh huh. Like, you had to fill out a health card and, like, get symptoms and then just go to different lines. Like, all these places. I don't know. I haven't traveled um, in the last well, year. Well, do you do that here when you're coming back from a, so you get infected, you have to fill out any health information? I don't know the answer to that. Um, my guess is yes, if you had to do it before. Well, I had to do it in my country when I landed there. Oh, it made you feel out yeah. that you weren't bringing Zika to your country. I don't think it was Zika. I think it was when they had, like, um, the H1, um, or whatever, like, they had all that stuff. They made us fill it out. But I don't know if they're, they have a health card for people coming back to the U.S. I, I don't know the answer to that, no. I have not gone any trips lately. <laughs> Okay. No. Very good. I'd like to thank Dr. Moyer for an excellent presentation. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, there are forms there in front of you. If you wouldn't mind completing those before you leave, and you can hand those in to Colette Davis, who's over here, or leave them at the front table. Everything's more convenient. And uh, please, if you have not done so already, uh, sign the uh, sheet there at, at the uh, entry table. Indicate your presence. That would be much appreciated. Thanks again. Thank you.